what I'm talking about is the subject of the book that I'm writing currently. So I am going to ask you a lot of questions and also on the stream. And any interesting things you tell me, I will steal them and put them in the book. So I, I hope you don't mind that. Uh, I am, I'm very happy to be following David especially because some of his themes I'm going to pick up on but look from a very different angle when he talked about things like community and identity being a human need that is timeless. I'm going to question that because I think although we have timeless human needs, we express them differently at different times. And for me, I think the changes in how we feel and understand and express those needs are just as important as technology. But I want to start by asking you uh, a couple of questions, and we will use the mentee. I will just tell you the options. So when did you last use a map, not, a, not an app that tells you, go here, go here, go here, but a map? that shows you the whole territory. Uh, was it uh, last week, last year, not since the last century, or what's a map? Uh, so uh, if you can answer now through Menti, and we'll, we'll see the votes coming in. Oh, oh, OK. Moving around. At some point, obviously, I have to just arbitrarily say stop, because I'm, this is a dictatorship, this stage, and I decide when you stop voting. OK, so it's settling down. Okay, so for a lot of you, not since the last century, and a few of you even, well, what, it, what even is a map? So I think I'm very old-fashioned because I used a map yesterday. I got a map from the hotel, and I walked around Hamburg, and I got lost, and I got the map out to see where I was. Okay, well, let's, let's try something else then, a little more personal, aptly. Pick your favorite thing that you're wearing today... Now, you don't have to tell me. I'm not going to ask you what it is, so just think of it in your mind. And I want to know, why, why do you have it? Why did you buy it? Was it because it's a practical reason, like it's warm or it's dry uh, or it's comfortable? Is it because it fits with the way you're meant to look, for maybe for work? Uh, is it because it expresses who you are? Or maybe it's something you didn't buy. You're actually wearing it because it was a, a gift from somebody else. Um, I realize that in some ways I have come dressed for the metaverse today. That was, uh, that was accidental. So you could say I've come dressed to fit in. Or you could say it expresses something about who I am because I am really interested in the way that we exist both as physical humans in this real world, but also as a digital profile in somebody else's mathematical model. Uh, and, it, and it was not a gift. So settling down expresses who I am. Very important. I must say, looking at you here in the, in the theatre, there's quite a relaxed vibe. I don't see many people in suits. So obviously, you feel that you can express who you are, which is, which is good. It's glad you're, you're here today. Uh, OK, so a couple of questions there. And, um, and I will come back to, to, to those. So those, those are the, the choices that you had. Now, I was thinking about, when I tried to pull together my idea that we live in a personalized world, this advert really struck me. Uh, it came up on my Twitter feed. Twitter, incidentally, decided I was a man, which is quite interesting. I'm, I'm not a man. Uh, and it also thinks that I'm about 30. I'm not about 30. Uh, but it showed me this advert. And for me, this really sums up personalized advertising, our personalized relationship with shopping. Imagine a shop that only sells clothes suited to you. Well, now you don't have to, because this service, Thread, will basically decide what things might suit you. And, this, and so this man in the advert, all the shops in the street have his face, and they're all called Stephen, which presumably is his name. So the whole universe reflects him back to himself. Now, this service, you give it some information about what you like, you choose some photos, you can upload information about yourself, and it will send you personal recommendations of clothes you should buy. And I just, I have to say, for a moment, I feel a lot of sympathy with all the men, because your choice of clothes to buy is really limited, isn't it? It's really narrow. I, you have my heartfelt sympathy. So what do I mean by the personalized century? It's, it's things like this. But I think to really understand what's new, we should contrast it with the previous century, the mass century. 
And I'm going to give you just three quick examples. The mass century, we had mass production. The, the production line is the classic image. You stand there, you do the same task all day, identical cars roll off the production line. And that's the, the classic advance, if you like, in production of the early 20th century. But today, this is the mini production line uh, in Oxford, in England, owned by BMW, obviously. Uh, but every single Mini that comes off that line is slightly different from the one before it, because customers now can choose the options of what they want their car to be like, so that it reflects not just their practical needs, but also how they see themselves. It projects who they think they are. Uh, media is a very obvious one. About 100 years ago, there were a few newspapers, a few radio channels, later television channels, and a few people at the top decided what was important, what was news, what was entertainment, and the rest of us had a bit of choice. You could choose your newspaper, perhaps, but we got the same thing as everybody else at roughly the same time in the same order. Uh, and that meant that we experienced some things really collectively. The, the most strong example for me is the moon landings, when the first people landed on the moon. Half a billion people watched that at the same time, all around the world. And that was about a quarter of all the people alive at that time watched the same thing at the same time. Now, we still share media experiences, but it's very, very different. Uh, apologies if you all leave now singing the Baby Shark song to yourselves. This has had over 9 billion views. That means that that's more than the number of people on the Earth today. So at least a billion people decided it was so good they were going to go back and watch it again. But more importantly, they decided to share it. So it spread like a virus through our collective cultural bloodstream, not because a few editorial people said, this is really important, the Baby Shark song is an important cultural artifact, but because it hit a nerve and enough people shared it, and then the people they shared it with shared it, and it spread peer-to-peer, -peer, flat, through a network. And that is, that is the difference. So today, we can say that each of us has our own personal channel for news and entertainment, which is part, still partly edited by editors, partly by the algorithms that decide what we want to see, partly by ourselves choosing, and partly by our network of friends and contacts. But it does mean that each of us, in a way, has a unique world. And certainly in terms of the media we consume, we have a unique world. Each of us lives in a distinct world. And one thing this has had an impact on, I think, is politics. Now, the 20th century was a lot of mass movements. There were mass movements that got us all the vote. And the fact that the masses now have the vote and really participate properly in democracy is a massive change. But those mass movements achieved other social changes. This is a march that, in fact, I was a teenager in the UK. You may recognize one of these actors has become very, very famous since then. It was a march for gay rights against a law that the government, in fact, did bring in in the UK for gay rights. And this is something that the changes have been extraordinary. Until 1980, it was illegal in Scotland for two men to be in a sexual relationship. It's so, so recent. Whereas now, certainly in the UK, two men can get married, they can adopt children. There really is no difference in law in how they're treated. So it, for me, there's a lovely paradox in that the mass movement of the 20th century, one of the things they achieved was not just the right for everybody to be treated equally, to be treated the same, but in fact, the right for people to be different and to live differently and be who they wanted to be. Uh, even when that was different from what other people wanted. That our, our right to be different, if you like, was one of the achievements of the mass movements. So, if this is the personalised century, how did we get here? Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail because it's a, it's a very big, long story, but for me, there are three really important trends that got us here and which are still propelling us into the future. The obvious one is technology. I mean, this is the Univac computer in the 1950s. It would fill up a room the size of this theater and would still not have the processing power of the phone that each of you has with you today. So that, that's one thing that 
The mainframe computers of the 20th century could keep track of the population, they could process censuses, they could, they could do the mass organizing that mass society needed, but the phones we have today come with us, and they gather data on each of us all the time, even as we sleep, and they feed that data back to other people who use it to build a digital profile of each of us, which they then use to give us a personalized offer of whatever it is. But I think technology is only part of the picture. We should ask ourselves, why have we ended up with this technology and not some different kind of technology? So there's two other things for me. One of them is choice. And that's partly an economic thing. It's partly because the mass production meant that things were very, very cheap. So the same people that work in the factories can buy the things made in the factories. So we have disposable income. So we don't have to just buy things for practical reasons. We can buy things that express who we are. But it's also social choice because of the social liberalization. Uh, we can live as we want to live. We don't have to grow up where our parents are, do the jobs that our parents did, marry somebody who lives down the street, have children, do the same things that our grandparents and their grandparents did. We have so many social choices, what kind of work to do, what to study, study two things, uh, what kind of place we want to live, what kind of relationships we want to have. All these are now a matter of choice, which is very freeing. We're freed from the kind of collective experiences that our grandparents had, but that also means that we have, a, we have a lot of choices to make, and we're not always sure that we've made the right choices, and we can feel a bit insecure about that. And the third one is identity. Now, I love this picture for two reasons. Uh, it's a little tattoo that says, just be. And that is one way of looking at identity, that we just want to be who we are. We want to be our authentic self. We don't want to have to pretend to be what somebody else thinks we ought to be. And that is definitely much more possible today. And in fact, it's almost seen today as our main purpose in life, to be our authentic self. A life spent pursuing your authentic self is seen as a good and a worthwhile life. But this person has tattooed just be on their skin as a message to the outer world. And that's the other side of identity today, that it's not enough to just be who you are, we want the world to recognize that person that we feel ourselves to be and reflect us back to ourselves and acknowledge that I am who I feel myself to be. And partly, I think, because of the element of choice, because we can choose who to be and how to express ourselves, there is always a little doubt that, is this really who I am? Have I chosen the right person to be? And that's why we want the world to constantly reflect us back to ourselves and recognize us and affirm that we are who we say we are, whether that's our closest friends and family, uh, people in the wider world, whether it's algorithms, uh, or whether it's society in general. We want to be recognized and affirmed in our identity. So where do we go from here? And I think this is the really difficult question, because in a way, we have been accelerated by coronavirus into this very individualized world that we relate through technology a lot. So I want to ask you another question. How do you like to stay in touch with your friends? Is it mainly text messages, telephone calls, social media, video chat, or in person? So again, you can vote on Menti and tell me your favorite way to stay in touch with your friends. Don't worry, it's anonymous, so if you really actually prefer just texting them, they'll never know it was you that said that. Oh, in person. Well, I don't know what the mix is between people answering in the theater or people answering at home, but uh, so there might be some selection bias that if you're here, of course you prefer seeing people in person, but I'm very happy to see that this is the most popular choice. I think for all the convenience of technology, there are things that we don't get any other way except in person. But text message is getting a lot of votes. Now, I'm going to show you, I'm going to compare your answers with the answers given in a survey of a thousand odd American teenagers. Sorry to cut short your, your voting process, 
But uh, can, can we go back to the slides, Mikhail? I know this is really fascinating. I kind of don't want to stop. Uh, I was going to ask you a supplementary question, but I thought maybe we didn't have time. to There's the difference between how you prefer to stay in touch and how you actually stay in touch. Because when I think about the amount of time I do spend with my friends and how much I spend relating through technology, it's definitely a lot more technology. But when they asked American teenagers this, slightly more of them actually preferred relating to them through text and SMS. And, uh, and in case you're thinking, well, of course, you know, there's, a, there's a pandemic on Timandra, they had to stay home. That survey was done in 2018, so it was done before COVID. Before COVID, American teenagers slightly preferred texting their friends than seeing them in person. Now, this depressed me, but I could understand it, because I remember being a teenager, and it was agony, wasn't it? It was awful. The, 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 you just, everything you say is wrong. You don't know if you're going to make your friends hate you. Maybe you fancy somebody, and then you've just made yourself look stupid by saying the wrong thing. The whole thing is a complete minefield. I'm just so thankful that I never have to be a teenager again. So I completely understand that teenagers would go, well... Yes, but if I see somebody face to face, I might say the wrong thing. Or they might say something and I have the wrong facial expression when they say it. If it's a text, I can read the text. I can think about what's the best way to respond to get the effect I want. I can answer it. Uh, it's all much more controllable. It's much less risky. And what worries me about the trend I think was already happening, but COVID has accelerated it, is that Life is less risky when you, when you relate through technology. You can control the risk. You can control the uncertainty and the mess, which is part of human relationships. When I arrived here yesterday, and I, and I met Mikhail, who's doing the, uh, the jumping between slides and surveys, we had a funny moment of, oh, do we, do we shake hands? Do we do elbows? Do we do knees? So we ended up doing a kind of little, little dance. But it was nice, because even that in itself, even that not knowing, really, how we should be relating to each other was a kind of human communication. It was just very spontaneous and, and fun and nice and not something you could possibly do through technology. Uh, I, I was thinking about the way on technology it's very easy. If someone posts something on social media, you can just double tap to say you like it. Uh, um, but you can't do that in real life. I did actually ask Ina whether we could give you all stickers that say double tap to like, so that if you met somebody here and they liked you, they could double tap your sticker. But apparently we can't because of COVID, sorry. So you have to go and make your own stickers or hats. But that's, that's what I mean. Real life is so much more complicated and risky, but that's, that's where the magic happens, isn't it? So I'm going to ask you another question. Why are you here? Is it, uh, well, for the amazing speakers, obviously, but you don't have to say that. Uh, is it because you've got an amazing project to promote? Is it because uh, there's particular people here you want to meet? Or is it just nice to not be at home? Or are you hoping something will happen here that you can't choose off an electronic menu? I, you also have the chance to say, actually, I am watching this on a screen at home, so please get through this bit because I'm feeling left out now. And can we just get on with the talk? <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, 4% of people who are watching at home. But we, we love you just the same. And technology is good, isn't it? Because we can actually connect when we can't physically be together. Hoping for something you can't get on an online menu. You are my people. That's the online menus will only take you so far. And I say that as somebody who has set you all these quiz questions. So uh, in honor of the people watching at home, let's, let's move on. Can we go back to the slides, please, Macau? Thank you. Uh, so I think my mission is to save the person from the personalized century. Because it's personalized, but it's not personal, is it? And we all know, I and mean, you're all very techy people, you know that when things are personalized to you, it's actually done by mathematics. It's just your data being put into a multi-dimensional grid of other people's data and, uh, and sorting you into groups according to measurable ways in which you're like and unlike other people, and that information is used to target you with things. We are made to feel like the world is being sorted and curated and pre-selected for us, but actually, it's us 
being sorted for other people's purposes. When they say, this is a service and there's a free service, you are being served not in the way that a king is served by servants, but in the way that a buffet is served. You are, you are sliced, you're sorted, you're put on plates with labels, you know, affluent car buyer, uh, ecologically conscious cyclist, and whoever wants to target people like you can just come along and pick you off the menu. So how do we get back to being a person in the personalized century? I think the core of the problem is the way we think about identity. Because we do think of ourselves in terms of identity today. It hasn't always been the case. You could, we could go back, we could blame Martin Luther, we could blame Immanuel Kant, we could blame Sigmund Freud. But the fact is, we think about ourselves in terms of an identity that is a thing, as if it's a colour of paint, and you could go, ah, oh, yes, that one is me, that colour is me, and to express myself, I just need to open the paint and paint the wall with it. But the thing about colours is colours don't mean anything if they just stay one colour in isolation. That doesn't change. The only way you can make meaning from colours is to mix them up with other colours and other people's colours and interact, and then your colours will change because you will get mixed up with other people's selves. You will interact. The things that you do with other people in society will change who you are, and that's as it should be. So I'm going to leave you with one little mission, and that is go and get a map doesn't have to be a paper map. In fact, I made a radio program about what Satnav was doing to our brains. And I said to the brain scientists, I'm worried that just following the blue dot is making me more stupid. And they said, yes, actually. If you just follow the blue dot, it will affect your memory, because memory and place are so connected. What you should do is look at a map, but it can be on a screen. It doesn't have to be a bit of paper. Try and get the map into your head, and then pay attention to the world you're walking through. So it's good for your memory to use a map. It's also it's good because it gives you a shared reality with other people. You may not be coming from the same place or going to the same place. You may not choose the same route, but you're all starting with the same map. And the third reason is that you will get lost, and you will have to talk to strangers, and you will have to ask them for help. And that, in a very, very, very tiny way, could be the beginning of rebuilding connections with people who are not like you, who don't get sorted into the same box that you do, but with whom you have something in common just by being a human in the same place in the world at that moment in time. Thank you. <laughs>